introduce our speaker for today. But before um, introducing Jane, I just want to remind you that next Friday there's no department seminar, but instead we'll <laughs> our beloved undergraduate students presenting their own work. Um, <laughs> it will be a 20, 20 hours marathon of talks. No, it's only like Wow, <laughs> divided by five. It will be exciting, and then after the week after that, will be um, a department uh, department conference again, and will be our uh, post lecture. So it will be stay tuned, and there will be more updates. So today, I'm very, very excited to introduce our speaker, Jane Willenbrink. She is a uh, associate professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. <coughs> uh, Jane grew up in North Dakota. She did her undergrad at North Dakota State University. And after that, she got a master's degree at Boston University. So after that, she moved to um, um, Canada and got the, sorry, I need to look it up. <laughs> got her PhD at, um, whew, it's a hard name for me. Dalhousie uh, University um, in Nova Scotia. I usually just say in Canada, and then people are like, oh, okay, yes. You know, we, <laughs> we study geology and geography, we've got to be a little bit better in that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, throughout Jane's career so far, she has been studying basically service processes, and then how different parameters like the climate, the tectonics, human activity, how those are going to influence the surface processes and, and to uh, create a landscape or to shape the landscape we are seeing today. So her work has covered um, Arctic region like North Pole, Antarctica, also to the tropical region like um, uh, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. <laughs> Sorry, that word is sick in my mind. <laughs> so, in fact, she has given one talk just two days ago um, at, uh, um, at um, Cosmos Club, and then she was talking about glacier, but today she has a different topic. So she's going to um, talk about the null hypothesis. So that's on globally constant rates of erosion and weathering during the last 10 million years. So let's welcome Jane. <laughs> Technical glitch. Um, so thank you all for coming. And um, I'm really happy to get an opportunity to talk to lots of you and um, have really enjoyed my visit so far. Um, even the breeze is a nice change from the, the constant temperature fluctuations that I get in San Diego. So, um, <laughs> so, <coughs> I was going to uh, start off by uh, just sort of drawing your attention to this beautiful landscape in the background here of the title slide. And um, when I was starting off doing my PhD, I had just done some field work in Antarctica for my master's degree and gotten really excited about glaciers. <coughs> and um, during that time at uh, Boston University, I was reading all these papers about how climate can drive tectonic processes through erosion. And I thought that that was just so thrilling, such a thrilling concept. And Mo Ramo was in our department at the time, and I idolized her. And, um, and so I, I decided to do that for my PhD, to go to a place in uh, the north and figure out how much glaciers are actually affecting the landscape. Um, from my experience in Antarctica, it seems like glaciers don't do very much, but then if you talk to everybody else, um, anecdotally, they all say, oh yeah, glaciers are huge. That's, that's a big, big process during the last two million years. Um, and uh, I really wanted to tackle this problem <coughs> during my PhD, and just as a little, uh, word of encouragement. I produced a PhD. It gets cited so in, you know, a little bit here and there. Um, but I really didn't answer this question, I think, to, to my satisfaction until my second postdoc. So it was something that I, I tried to work on during my PhD. 
and then uh, sort of kept in the back of my mind, like, oh, if only we had other tools to handle this, I think we could do a better job. So if at first you don't succeed during your PhD in answering a particular question, keep at it, and maybe you'll get a little bit more progress on it later. So um, the reason that a lot of people are interested in uh, this idea of glaciation, glaciation inducing a change in the erosion rates over time is because of this process and it goes back to the carbon cycle. So this is probably old news to lots of you, to some of you who might be new or study uh, things like uh, geophysics. <laughs> it might be new, <laughs> just, just teasing. I, I, all the geophysicists I know know this stuff anyway. Um, so part of this um, process is that we have a lot of outgassing from the mantle, right? We through volcanoes and spreading ridges, and this is our source of CO2. And so the reason that Earth is this uh, wonderfully pleasant day in College Park, Maryland today is not because of the CO2 going into the atmosphere necessarily, although that makes it pleasant too, is that we have a process of removing, of sequestering that CO2 from the atmosphere as well. And that makes it so that we're not burning up <coughs> constantly and, that, and it's actually responsible for life because of the habitable temperature we find ourselves in right now. So that CO2 comes out of the mantle, goes into the atmosphere, mixes with rain to produce carbonic acid, and this slightly acidic uh, rainwater interacts with weathered uh, or weatherable materials in the Earth's surface. And um, this silicate weathering process um, is the process that sort of breaks down by chemical action some of the Earth's surface materials. And then the calcium and the so, uh, bicarbonate ions are transported by rivers into the ocean, increasing the alkalinity in the ocean, also increasing the ability of the ocean to pull in CO2 as dissolved CO2. And ultimately, that uh, calcium and bicarbonate gets sequestered in the ocean as carbonate. So think limestone and uh, little critters that make their shells. So this is the process ultimately whereby we kind of keep Earth's temperature at sort of a nice habit habitable temperature. And um, this is one of the ways that per perturbing this system is one of the ways that people have thought that climate can actually change over time is by changing the weatherability of Earth. And so one of the things that was proposed um, that was one of uh, a big inspirational uh, couple of papers by Ramo and Rudiman in the late 80s and early 90s for me was this uplift hypothesis. And this was the idea that this is time here and this is today or zero million years ago and here's the uh, oxygen isotope curve from um, benthic foraminifera. And you can sort of use this as a sort of proxy for temperature via ice volume, also a little bit salinity. And so the idea is that 50 million years ago or so, we were really warm and that we've been progressively getting colder and colder with a couple of um, little excursions superimposed on this long-term down draw. And the correlation of the timing of the Indian subcontinent slamming into the Eurasian plate was thought to be one driver of this process. And so um, the idea was that the timing of slamming into this and creating this huge Himalayan orogeny was actually one of the drivers for an increase in silicate weathering and it actually caused Earth to get cold over that process because the Himalayas are so huge the flux of sediment is so huge and because the amount of sediment is thought to scale with the amount of CO2 that's, um, that, that is sequestered through that uh, silicate weathering process. And so then, Hay in 1992 said, hey, there are, I didn't even, I did not, that was a, a bad joke. I did not plan to say that. Hey, there's a lot of uh, other mountain ranges that are po seemingly popping up during this time too. And so it could be that we had this global uh, sort of uplift event. 
where we had lots and lots of uh, uplift of different mountain ranges at this time. So the Sierra Nevadas showed sort of a rejuvenation maybe over the last 10 million years. The Andes seemed like they were popping up um, in the late Cenozoic, Greenland, Baffin Island, all places that maybe should have had sort of some, some places that should have had decaying landscapes were actually increasing in relief, or seemingly so. And so um, then, <clears throat> in sort of a really provocative uh, piece, Peter Molnar and Phil England actually said, well, hold on, they were geodynamicists, actually. So it's a, a good advertisement for an interdisciplinary department where people can listen to different ideas and, and sort of put the reins on certain ideas. So they said, well, hold on, you can't have, there are tectonic boundary conditions. You can't have everywhere going up at once. Some places have to slow down if other places are going up at the same time. And so they came up with this paper of late Cenozoic uplift of mountain ranges and global climate change, chicken or egg. So whereas the previous argument was that the uplift of the mountain ranges actually <coughs> caused the climate change, they were saying, what if it's actually the climate change that is giving us the indication that things are going up or that things are uplifting, rock is uh, uplifting. As, an, as evidence for this, they pointed to this uh, area of the Mississippi River mass flux. So mass flux is up here and this is uh, about today. So this is time on this axis. And you'll note, it's kind of hard to see, but it's going along, trucking along at some sort of low level here and then we hit the last two million years and it just shoots up. And they thought, well, this is weird because you know, this is obviously not related to anything related to a huge mountain range that's going up at this time. I wonder if it's climate change instead because of course the Mississippi River drains lots of places where you had former, um, or glaciation during the last glacial maximum and the previous Northern Hemisphere glaciations. And so this became sort of a grand unifier. You know, if it's not globally driven uplift that's actually increasing all of this erosion and weathering that causes the increase in, or the decrease in CO2 in the atmosphere, what else could it be? So then he, they flipped it and said, well, it could be that climate change is actually giving us an indication that there is a big mountain range. But we know that there's not a big mountain range in here that's, that's trucking all this sediment into the Mississippi River Delta. And so they went further and said, look at this. We can think about isostatic effects as well. So imagine that the crust is floating on a more dense mantle, kind of like an iceberg. And then if we cut a little V in this iceberg and lost some of that mass that can uh, retain sort of the area, we would uh, cause an uplift of this iceberg right here, right? So the peaks would seem to be going up just through isostasy and de density differences. And so that could be the reason why everybody thinks that we've had increase in uplift. It's not necessarily that we've had an increase in tectonic processes, for example, increase in spreading at ridges, for example, but we could actually have be seeing the effects of unloading of the crust from removing a whole bunch of sediment. And they went on and saw that um, there are a couple papers by Molnar and company <clears throat> later on. This is actually a reproduction of a curve from, from Hay, where they're looking at, this is time again on all these horizontal axes and sediment mass over here. And you can see that for lots of these different river sh uh, watersheds, that you increase the amount of sediment in recent time over the last five million years, the last two million years with glaciation being part of that. Okay, so this all kind of seems to make sense. There's a chicken or egg, and it seems like something was happening. Maybe it caused climate change. Maybe it was the result of climate change, unclear. So one thing that came up is that um, we have this process where we have CO2 uh, cycling through the ocean, the atmosphere, and into and from mantle degassing. 
And then we also have this uh, relationship. So it's an empirical relationship between the erosion rates that we can measure, both from soils in black and rivers in gray. So we can actually uh, take a, s a suspended sediment sample and calculate what that sediment flux is and get a rate. And then we can do the same thing with weathering. So we can take that same bottle of water from the river and figure out how many ions are in it. And we can say, for this amount of sediment, we get this amount of chemical weathering products in our water. <coughs> and so this empirical relationship tells us that probably, on average, if you increase erosion rate, you're going to increase the amount of chemical weathering that you have. And it could go the other way. So this is one of those chicken or egg things that graduate students all over the United States, all over the world, are trying to figure out what causes which. So is it that if you increase the erosion rate, you're grinding up things through creation of glacial tills, for example, grinding up surface areas and creating more reactive surfaces, which then makes them easier to weather? That could be one way it goes. Or it could be that as you weather things in the tropics, for example, you decrease the grain size through that weathering process and then make them easier to transport. That's another thing that people have suggested. Or other people have suggested, no, in fact, there's a common cause that drives both of them, such as the amount of water moving through a system that increase both the amount of erosion and the amount of chemical weathering. So this is an open question. I encourage graduate students who have not yet written your proposal <laughs> to take it on. <laughs> OK, the problem, though, that people figured out is that if you have this massive, massive mountain range like the Himalayas and another you know, massive mountain range that's maybe being affected by glaciers and things like that, like the Andes, um, that is really controlling the sediment flux in a big way. Some people think that, that those mountains are creating 90% of the total mass flux going into the ocean. So if you don't have big mountains, and then you create big mountains, you're going to rapidly increase your chemical weathering rate. At least that's the idea. And so there are a couple of models, uh, one from Berner and Caldera from a long time ago now, that said, well, hold on. If you actually change the weatherability of the Earth, even a little bit, you actually can sequester CO2 quite rapidly. And so this is something that people have been sort of pondering in terms of a geoengineering strategy, actually. Whether that's a good idea or not is a different talk. Um, so here's time on this axis, and here's the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration on this axis. So here we were at pre-industrial atmospheric CO2 levels uh, right here. And if we just change the silicate rock weathering by 25%, and people were suggesting that it would change by 90% as a result of the Himalayas going up in a big way. So if you just change it 25%, you actually can sequester, within less than a million years, the couple hundred gigatons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And of course, this process probably took a long time to happen. And so we've had more than a million years since the rise of the Himalayas. And yet here we are with CO2. So what is, going on, what is going on there? So the other thing that's kind of odd about this is that if we think about not just the rise of the Himalayas, but uh, glaciation in the Northern Hemisphere in particular over the last two million years, what we see is that there's actually not a huge decrease in paleo proxies of CO2 over this time interval. So they're pretty flat. It's actually a big range and so some people would argue that some of them are right and some of them are not right. Um, but you didn't change, you didn't obviously sequester 90% of your CO2 over that time interval. Um, and in fact, sort of a, a lumper versus a splitter, a lumper argument for this would be that it doesn't seem like it changed much at all. All right, so uh, I'm going to argue during this talk then in fact, it's not a chicken, and it's not an egg, but it's actually none of the above, okay? 
So <clears throat> we're going to start off talking about what the null hypothesis actually is in this case. So that's always something that's good to have when you start off with a scientific experiment. What's our null hypothesis, our starting hypothesis? What should we see different from a standard amount or value? And then we're going to go into, well, if the mountains or glacial processes might increase certain erosion or weathering rates in some places, why might it not matter globally? And then I'm going to go into a new proxy that I developed or helped develop during my, um, during my postdoc that I think um, helps to solve this problem. OK. You guys ready? OK, awesome. <laughs> OK, so the null hypothesis, I always come back to sort of mass balance questions and um, heat flux questions. So in this case, my sort of null hypothesis, it comes from tectonics. And I love this um, Dave Rowley quote, the global rate of ridge production is expected to correlate with the changes in the mean rate of heat production in the mantle. Given the long time scales needed to affect the global heat production and the correlation of mantle viscosity to the mantle temperature, the null expectation is that on the short time scales, like we see down here, for example, there should have been little to no change in the amount or the seafloor spreading rate, right? And so here's a compilation of seafloor spreading rates. And if anything, the seafloor spreading has been maybe going down a little bit, but certainly hasn't been increasing like we would see if we had an increase in tectonics everywhere, for example. So if we had an increase in mountain ranges being built, we should see as like a conveyor belt, we should see that if, if there's more convergence over here, it has to come from somewhere, right? So it comes from that spreading ridge. So we see little to no change over here over the last 10 million years. So at least on this time scale, we're not seeing, at least in the spreading part of that signal, any big change in, in rate. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm going to make a correction to this quote. Oh, what's that? He doesn't mean heat production, he means flux. He probably doesn't mean flux. This is Because production right would be, in, be specific to the radioactive elements of the king, and he means flux. He means flux. I agree with you. It's cut and pasted, so <laughs> take it up with Dave. <laughs> <laughs> So the other thing that we are interested in is what do we do about these records, right? So in this case, these records are telling us that over time, so again, here's zero, we've had this big increase in sediment and weathering products because there's also carbonate in this mass, right, which is the ultimate uh, burial ground for weathering products. And so why is it that we could have no change in erosion and still have this huge increase in the amount of sediment that goes into the ocean? So this one, I'm going to walk you through a little bit. This goes back to a conservation of mass argument, not conservation of heat. So in this case, we have a place where we get a source of sediment, and we have a place where that is the sink of sediment. And so if people are saying that there's an increase in erosion coming from the uplands, and there has to be a place for that to go, right? And the way that we actually figure out where sediment is going is that we take cores, right? Nowadays, we actually can do seismic uh, profiles and things like that to actually get a volume but a lot of these early measurements that I was showing before are actually just from independent cores. And so when, when we're taking a core, we're taking it through something that's there today, right? But how stratigraphy is laid down is actually in this process, right? Where you have something going up, and then maybe something goes down a little bit, and then up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And then the ultimate package, sediment package, that you get is a combination of both the deposition cycles, but then also the stuff that we don't have that's lost through erosion over time. <coughs> so um, if you wanted to actually figure out 
if there's been constant sediment over time. You don't want to just concern yourself with aggradation or progradation of sediment, but you'd actually like to know both of those. Ultimately, you'd like to have a volume, but if we can't have a volume, we'd actually like to have both this way and this way, how sediment has been building up over time. So uh, Pete Sadler has um, taken a whole bunch of measurements. Sadler and uh, Doug Gerald Mack helped with this, looking at linear aggradation and pr linear progradation rate. So the aggradation is the arrow pointing up here that look like little mountain ranges. And the progradation are these gray ones over here. And so all of the sediment sort of mass that's going into the ocean should be mostly accommodated by sediment aggradation and progradation, because it can do both. And sometimes when you have erosion intervals, you are degrading the surface of a delta, for example, but then you're prograding your delta out. So you really have to keep track of both of those things in order to have a good representation of what the actual sediment mass is. And so if you multiply those together, the progradation and the aggradation, you get a <coughs> aerial growth rate right over here. And so if this changes based on the time scale. This is how many years of averaging time you have. But basically, and then this is all really, really short term. But over long terms, this is actually pretty flat. So here's a flat red line to make you think it's more flat than it is. Sorry about that. <laughs> And this is something that's actually really well known in the geologic record, that if you're looking at hiatuses that are incorporated, that you can actually um, uh, interpret your sedimentation record differently, depending on how long your core spans of averaging time. So some, some people call this, um, it's been known for a long time, not just for um, strata measurements, but also for rates of evolution, <laughs> and that you can actually get um, a whole bunch of measurements measured, or measurements measured. You can take a lot of measurements and put them on a plot like this, which gives you a sense of how measurement thickness of strata changes with the time scale over which you measure it. So here's a figure from Gerald Mack and Sadler from 2007 where they've done just this. There's 25,000 measurements taken from all over the world, all kinds of depositional environments, just as a sort of a buckshot approach to see how does measurement interval actually affect the rate that we get from depositional systems. And so what they see is that over here, you have high rates, so these are short time spans. These are equal rates. This red is high rate, this orange is uh, slightly less high, and over here in purple is the lower rates. And you'll see that as you increase your time span, you happen to plot in lower and lower rates. And there's all kinds of reasons why this could be. If you take sort of a, a straw man argument for why this would be, and just think of it being like a random process, where things are going up and down willy-nilly, sort of like a random walk behavior, then a random walk behavior would give you something that looks like this. So here we have either erosion rate, log of erosion rate, or log of sedimentation rate. Either one you can look at the same way. And then the log of integration time. And then if you just imagine a random distribution of hiatuses in there, so sort of a random walk, this relationship gives you the sedimentation or erosion rate, doesn't matter, is something to the age to the minus this exponent. So this is 0.5 for a random distribution of hiatuses. So <coughs> let's say that there are all these piles that are moving up and down all over the place. So if you have fewer hiatuses or more continuous deposition, let's say, like a lake, your exponent is lower. If you have more hiatuses, like a floodplain, this exponent is um, 0.75. Of course, it's negative 0.75. So you're changing your rate differently. So let's think about these records that they're getting this big change in the last five million years from. So this is the, the plot from Hay, 
where we have age on this axis, here's zero again, and here's that mass, here's this big increase in the last five million years. And so let's plot it on log-log space. Here I've plotted just the midpoints of those, and here is the mass per time. So on a log, the best fit line through this will give you age to the minus 0.5. That's funny, right? Haha, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. -ha. yes, funny haha, -ha. or funny weird. <laughs> so here's sort of another type case for where climate might have affected erosion rates or deposition rates. So this is one that people often point to. Um, it's similar to that first tidal slide that I had where glaciers are carving up the whole landscape. This is from the Eastern Alps, and we see the same kind of behavior again where we have this big ramp up in rates of erosion here. And if we plot it on log-log space, here's the midpoints plotted, here's it plotted on log-log space, our best fit power law gives you a minus 0.5. That's interesting. If we go to mass accumulation rates in Asia around the Cenozoic, we see that we have this big increase in recent time. They even said in their paper that this looks like a power law with an exponent of minus 0.5. So that's interesting to me that like all of these different sedimentary records might actually be telling us something about a random process that we just might happen to be sampling in a random way and getting this appearing increase in rate over the last five million years. So I actually don't like power laws <laughs> and I'm not going to be talking about them ever again. So if you didn't like that part of the talk, fine with me. It's over. <laughs> if you do uh, sedimentary records and you're annoyed with me now, the rest of the talk will go much better for you. I promise. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> so you don't have to believe any of that, but I did find the minute I realized that, I started to doubt a little bit. And the minute you doubt something a little bit, you open yourself up to alternative hypotheses. And so that's what I'm gonna tell you about now. So um, the next part of the talk is why mountains or glacial processes might actually increase local erosion or weathering rates, but why it might not matter globally. Okay, so I'd like all of you to close your eyes, but not for too long. <laughs> and imagine your favorite place on Earth. Now imagine the dominant erosion process. Now open your eyes. Now imagine that dominant erosion process and how it changes with climate intervals. Can you imagine that? So here's, um, here's a favorite place some people might have. And this might be really affected by, let's say it's Cascadia. This might be really affected by glaciation. So during glacial events, you might have high erosion, right? And then during non er, interglacial times, you might have a turning off of the geomorphic system because you have disrupted your drainages, you have uh, cobbles that are now too big to be carried by the discharge, that sort of thing. And you might actually go down in terms of how the landscape responds to that new change. Now imagine your second favorite place, right? That second favorite place is probably North Dakota. <laughs> no, one, no one's favorite place has ever been North Dakota. I don't think. Um, so maybe it's in the southwest, right? And so that might have an opposite response to glaciation, right? During glaciation, it might actually uh, get, get much more stable because of vegetation impacts, right? It might get wetter, and it might actually um, stabilize the whole place. And so you could imagine two other places that have the opposite um, effect from climate change and geomorphic response to climate change. So if we put a whole bunch of places up here, we can start to imagine, just as a little thought experiment, how it's possible, well, a lot of different places can actually change, but you might actually get the same mean even during that uh, timing change. Uh, the other effect is that sometimes geomorphic systems 
actually take a really long time to respond to a change in climate. So sometimes it takes millions of years for something to, for the rivers to actually realize that places are different. So I was really interested in this, um, this idea of how much mountains matter for sediment flux and whether the Himalayas were actually producing, you know, 90% of the sediment or big mountains were actually producing 90% of the sediment or not and made this map. And when I made this map of where the highest slopes are and where the land area is for those different slopes, it struck me because although mountains pack a big punch, so here's the mountains over here and here and over here, they actually make up a really, really tiny fraction of the Earth's surface. And so I'd read my whole academic life about how mountains really matter in terms of global fluxes into the ocean, but I had to convince myself after seeing this map that that was actually true, because it was actually done before even GIS was sort of used for such purposes. And um, my bread and butter technique, though I haven't talked about it yet, is using cosmogenic nuclides to understand how surfaces change over time. You can read about it in this nice elements volume if you like. If you send me an email, I will give you a link to download the whole thing for free. It's nice for teaching. Um, and so cosmogenic nuclides are nuclides that are produced, they're very rare, and some of them, like beryllium-10, my favorite, is produced um, only through this mechanism. So it only has this cosmogenic source. So cosmic radiation goes, uh, interacts with uh, target atoms or elements in the atmosphere, um, also interacts with target elements in the Earth's surface. So the ones that are produced, the cosmogenic isotopes that are produced inside the mineral lattices are called in situ cosmogenic nuclides, those like radiocarbon, which is kind of the most famous of the cosmogenic nuclides, which is uh, formed in the atmosphere, that's the one that most people know, is <coughs> um, also produced in the atmosphere and then eventually falls to the ground with rain. We're going to talk about <coughs> both of them in the talk, but during this part of the talk, I'm just going to talk about in situ beryllium-10. So as surface materials are exposed to this cosmic radiation, they build up beryllium-10. So you could use it for a dating technique, so to figure out the ages of boulders, for example, um, of materials like moraines. Um, but you can also use it as a proxy for how fast, actually not even a proxy, a quantitative measure of how fast something erodes. So the longer something sits on the surface exposed to cosmic radiation, the more beryllium it builds up. And if you're constantly sloughing off that surface material, you're gonna have less and less beryllium in that surface deposit. And so you can actually quantify over long time periods through the time that it takes for particles to move through that attenuating zone, how much, how fast the mass has been removed from on top of it, let's put it that way. So we can get the mass flux. The cool thing, I just talked about all that in the previous slide, I got ahead of myself. The cool thing about it is that it measures both physical erosion mass loss, so particles actually, pebbles being removed from the surface, but also mass loss due to chemical weathering. So the mass is what attenuates the cosmic radiation, and so the beryllium-10 is um, affected by both mass loss from chemical weathering and physical erosion. So I wanted to understand how the world was eroding, and so I went to all of the measurements that existed. This is from a paper from 2013. There are now thousands more samples and a new compilation. Um, but these were the, 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 the river basins or watersheds that existed at that time. And um, some these dots are where someone took some sand and then later back at the lab measured the beryllium-10 inside that river sediment where it gets you an averaged basin-wide erosion rate for that particular catchment. So then, of course, this is really bad coverage and so what I wanted to do is the places in the world that aren't covered by this beryllium-10 measurement, how can we figure out what erosion rates are like there? <coughs> 
And it turns out that there's actually a really good relationship between denudation rate, which is the sum of mass and chemical weathering, or uh, mass removal, and average basin slope. So tectonic sort of rules in this case. And in fact, this uh, exponential relationship between the two, so the dots here are cosmogenic nuclides, and the squares are the same data, but from the biggest rivers in the world. So they both have the same exponential form. Not sure why it's exponential. If someone knows, please tell me. And the interesting thing is that this explanation, exp exponential relationship actually explains about 50% of the variance, which is a lot for a natural system that is perturbed by all kinds of different things. They all have different climates, different rock types. Um, and so one variable actually explains 50% of the variance, which I thought was cool. So we also know the slopes, where the slopes are on Earth, right? That was the first map that I showed you. And so we can just take that, that relationship between slope and denudation rate, and then we can figure out how much of the, wor of the world's erosion comes from different places. And it turns out that it's actually not 90% coming from mountain ranges. It's only about 50%. So uh, here is 50% of the mass flux is somewhere in this blue coming from 80% of the land, right? Okay, the interesting thing I think is that river loads also follow the same relationship. And so why would something that is averaging over long time scales, which cosmogenic isotopes do, do the same thing as river loads, which are basically just people that are taking measurements over maybe decades, maybe 100 years if you're lucky. And I think that the real benefit here is that you've had um, a buffering capacity, right? So in some cases, the floodplains are giving you the same relationship or the same time integration through integrating through space. So I think this is one way that we're able to not necessarily instantly perturb the erosion rates on Earth, even if there is some big change in climate. It has to take that signal all the way through these floodplains, and through that time, the signal is damped and buffered. Okay, whew, two for three, right? We just talked about how mountains don't matter as much as we thought, and that different places might have different responses to the same climate change. And so it could be that everything is staying constant over time. So now um, these are all sort of, I don't know, sort of uh, thought exercises. But now I really want to measure something, measure something that will tell us if this is the case. And I'm going to use, again, my favorite isotope, beryllium-10, the 10-9 system. So now instead of talking about in situ beryllium-10, we're actually going to talk about beryllium-10 that is formed in the atmosphere. If you're a geochemist, we're going to use beryllium-10 as the constant flux proxy. So we're assuming that beryllium-10 is constant through time, produced constantly. Okay, So that's actually not true, because there are changes in the geomagnetic field, things like that. But for our integration timescales and the timescales of our record, I think it's OK to say that. We can talk about that more during the question time, if you'd like. So the beryllium-10 is from the atmosphere. Beryllium-9, we haven't talked about that. That's the native isotope of beryllium. So that's the stable form. I should have said that beryllium-10 is also, it decays with a half-life of 1.4 million years. So it's a uh, radioactive isotope. The beryllium-9 is stable, and it comes from riverine input. So if you expose a, a silicate mineral, or basically any mineral, actually, to weathering, the beryllium will leach out of it and absorb to the outside. The longer it leaches, the more beryllium is on the outside, the less that is on the inside. So we have beryllium being shot into the ocean through plumes from rivers, just like chemical weathering products. These two are well mixed through gyres in the ocean on a short enough time scale that they are probably well mixed very quickly. Um, and the beryllium-10 decays with a half-life of 1.4 million years. I said that. So the other nice thing about it is that they adsorb to sediments very readily. 
And so some beryllium-9 makes it out into the open ocean, mixes with beryllium-10, and then we can find it in sediments, actually on the outside of sediments, pelagic sediments in the ocean that faithfully record the beryllium chemistry of the ocean through time. We can also look in ferromanganese nodules at the bottom of the ocean that also um, take up the beryllium and record faithfully the beryllium-10 over time. But just to see if it's actually recording what we think it is, because it's a new isotopic system, wanted to do some checks. And the first check that we did was in the ocean. And so what we find is that the beryllium 10-9 ratio, this is times 10 to the negative 7 over here, for the Pacific is around 1, 1 to 1.25 for an average. This is the modern ocean range. And in the Atlantic, it's about 0.5. So this is important because we have more chemical weathering products going into the Atlantic than we do the Pacific for the same area, or for different areas, but we can correct for the area. OK, so that's good. We actually think that this should be 0.5 and this should be 1 for the chemical weathering fluxes. And there are papers that talk about exactly how much denudation should give you exactly which um, which particular ratio of beryllium 10 to 9. So the other thing that we want to do if we have a new isotopic system like this is that we want to make sure not just that the modern ocean makes sense, but that when it goes from modern to the place that it's deposited, that it's actually making sense there too. So we go to a place um, where we have things like sediment, where we can sample right at the surface of the sediment. So that's today's sediment. And we can get the beryllium 10-9 ratio from that. We can go to a, play, a ferromanganese crust and take off just the tiny, tiny top amount, which is today's uh, beryllium 10-9 ratio. And we can plot that. And what we see is that they basically match. So zero time gives us something that falls within the range of the modern ocean. And in the Atlantic, we get something that falls in the range of the modern ocean. So let's imagine going back in time now. This is not data that I'm going to show you next, but it's just an imagination line of what should happen over time. So if we think that the weathering flux has increased as a result of increased erosion from quaternary glaciations, what we would expect is that our beryllium-9 should go up, increased weathering fluxes. And actually, it's really increased denudation fluxes. And that that would bring our line down. So this is what we would expect if the hypothesis for either the chicken or the egg is correct, that we have more chemical weathering and more erosion fluxes going into the ocean. So what do we see? So first, I'm going to show you a core that was one of the first cores uh, that was measured. Um, it's been independently dated by paleomag, which is how we correct back <coughs> the beryllium that is now gone after time, because remember it decays with a half-life of 1.4 million years. So uh, we don't, so there's a bunch of scatter because this is back in 1989. Later measurements by AMS are much better. But there's basically no big downward trend like we'd expect if the beryllium 10-9 ratio was really going down. If we measure more of these, these are more cores from the Pacific. These are both ferromanganese crusts and cores. They all basically show the same thing. There's some scatter here, but we don't see this big decline like we would expect if the weathering and erosion fluxes were increasing over this time. If we go to the Arctic, we see sort of the same thing. There, these are better measurements now. That is 2008. Um, and there's some structure here that are interpreted in an interesting way as actually meltwater discharge events, which is super interesting and we're working on it in my lab. Um, but there's basically no huge downward trend like we'd expect. Uh, more Atlantic cores. Uh, again, no huge decrease like the line that we showed coming down. And so just to sum up the beryllium 10-9 proxy, in the Pacific, flat. This is the band of the modern Pacific Ocean range. In the Atlantic and the Arctic, flat. This is the band of the modern range. 
no change over time. It's about the same over time. And so for conclusions, just to wrap up, um, we, ha we talked about how there was flat beryllium-10-9 in the Atlantic, flat beryllium-10-9 in the Pacific. I didn't have time to talk about this, but there's another weathering proxy that shows that the last 10 million years has been similar uh, using uh, lithium isotopes. Atmospheric CO2 is pretty flat over this time period. Crust production, flat over this time period, nothing going on. And sedimentation rate, flat, nothing going on. So I think it's, I think it's not a chicken or an egg. I think we've all been um, sort of uh, looking at the data and making some interpretations that you don't need to make. And so I would uh, offer that we all, if you want to believe in the chicken or egg, that's totally fine. But I encourage you to have multiple working hypotheses. And the third working hypothesis, hypothesis should maybe be that nothing happened whatsoever over this time period. So um, future directions that we're working on in my lab, if you, are, uh, if you know some some smart people that want to come work with me. We're trying to use this proxy to understand the impact of anthropogenic erosion. We're trying to figure out whether climate or, uh, uplift impacts mineral weathering rates. I should say that the measurements that we did in the Antarctic, or the Arctic, Atlantic, and the Pacific were whole ocean proxies. So they were in the center of an ocean basin. So they should be integrating all of the surrounding terrain. If we went close to a specific place, you can actually see changes in the erosion. The only reason it doesn't change over time is because you're integrating these huge areas. So it doesn't preclude the idea that we actually did change erosion rates in some places. It's that globally, it did not change. Um, so we're actually going to specific places to see how it changed after the rise of the Andes for, example, Andes, for example, or the rise of New Zealand. And then we can also use, um, we just had a paper come out looking at how we can use beryllium-10 as a, a polar meltwater flux, which is really neat. And so I just want to end by thanking you for listening and then thanking all of the uh, collaborators and funding agencies for uh, allowing this to happen. So thanks. Take questions. With carbon 13, I, uh, carbon 14, sorry, I sort of understand that we've done a short time scale with the assumed <laughs> production ratio is the same. But can you assume that with beryllium 10 for going back 10 million years? But it's being produced at the same rate in the atmosphere. Yeah, so <clears throat> the one way that we get around the idea of the magnetic field variations affecting it, which also affects. Um, C14, for example, but you correct for that using calibration curves, right? Um, so the one thing that, that we have in our favor in that instance is that when these cores are sampled, we can, s we can take a measurement that integrates over long periods of time. So especially for the crusts, you can integrate over hundreds of thousands of years um, or a hundred thousand years, in which case your difference due to magnetic field, which could explain some of those wiggles um, in, in those largely flat records. So that could be from geomagnetic field variation. Um, that's sort of the scale that we would expect. Whether there was times in the last 10 million years where we're getting a higher cosmic ray flux, I don't really know. There's no indication from meteorite studies that that is the case. Um, and a lot of these uh, cosmic rays are coming from, well, we think that they're coming from supernova explosions. And so um, presumably those are happening all around us and take a while to get to Earth. And so perhaps the averaging out of that process through space and time is giving us a constant flux over 10 million years. But some people think that sometimes we go through cosmic dust storms and that would increase. We don't see really any blips or anything from an incident of a 
some event like that. Um, and again, I think what would have to, so one, sometimes people make the argument that the cosmic ray flux is exactly matching the change in erosion, but in an opposite direction. And that would be quite a coincidence for the cosmic ray flux just to happen to exactly cancel out the change in erosion over that time. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to add to it. Uh, there are a number of sources of the cosmic ray as much as supernovae, uh, but there are a very large number. Of them. The, the flux, as best we can see, is uh, relatively constant. And I'd add to that that there is very clear evidence, particularly in iron 60, for the Earth being exposed to two nearby supernovae two million years and another one at six million years ago because there is iron 60 on the seafloor today that came from these two different events. So we, and so we did not have any other evidence that accompanied the supernova sand deposition, if you will, uh -huh. that there was a dramatic change in hmm. galactic I'd like, I'd like to get those references from you. Maybe sure. I can send you an email. Uh, That'd be great. Yes? Um, that was a really thought-provoking talk, and I have a complex question. But, okay. Yeah, so, bear with me for a second. And, uh, but it may have no answer, but it would be great to hear your opinion. So, in, um, in the rivers in, the, in North America, you see increases in, in uh, chemical weathering products. And um, you know, calcium, magnesium, and carbonate. And just, as, just like you were saying, uh, it, it's over most of the United States, the big rivers, in the, in the northern part of the United States, and the eastern part, even areas that weren't experiencing recent glaciation. But, um, but in the southwest, it's different. So when you were talking about the differences in, I think, erosion, or you know, how different places have these, these different patterns, you see that in the southwest, too, where it's a different pattern. So this is over the last 100 years, if you, if you look at this, uh, you know, these weathering products. And, um, and so the question is, one question is, um, we've always thought it's due to anthropogenic activities, like you mentioned, anthropogenic erosion. We've, we've, we've called it human accelerated weathering due to acid rain, due to salt pollution, ion exchange, and all that. Um, do you think that um, it could be related, as you mentioned, like alternative hypotheses? It's, it's really a good way to think about it, and kind of inspiring. So do you think it could be related to this temp, like, We've also seen an increase in temperature change in the rivers. Could, could um, over the last hundred years, could is the, is the change in temperature enough to produce this effect, or is it due to erosion? We never really thought of erosion, um, but you know, in the most developed areas, you see uh, you know the biggest fluxes of these these cations. So, I guess the question is, could it be related to changes in temperature? or erosion that also shows patterns over the last hundred years. I know it's a more recent time field weathering products in the world. Great question. So I think, um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I read a recent paper by um, Peter Raymond at Yale who kind of um, looked at gauging data from this time yeah. interval that you're talking about. And I forget what the, this is bad that I read the whole paper and don't remember the punchline, but I remember that it um, ultimately, I think he couldn't figure out if it's increase in discharge that was causing the increase in the weathering fluxes or increase in temperature that was causing the increase in weathering fluxes. So when you add the third factor of increased erosion from anthropogenic causes, I think it gets even more complicated. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that. That would be a great thing to pursue in the future. One thing that we have done um, in my group is to try to tackle this question of how much did, because anthropogenic erosion rates or sedimentation rates are by nature over short time scales, they also are subject to these time scale biases, right? And so if you go to floodplains, for example, and measure sedimentation rates, if you can measure something in the early Holocene that is over a short time interval, 
<coughs> then it happens to have the same sedimentation rate as a similar time interval in the last 200 years. So what we've been interpreting as anthropogenic could just be a function of the time scale over which we are doing that measurement. Um, so we, we've been trying to figure out, like, if you wanted to ask that question, how do you actually figure out if humans are eroding the landscape? I mean, everyone can tell that they are, so that's not a question. But actually figuring out how much they are is quite challenging. Um, and then figuring out if it's increasing or decreasing the weathering is another matter because it could be that the sediments just go into an anoxic floodplain and just sit there and maybe it's not increasing the weathering necessarily. So in terms of this tectonics and uh, climate uh, coupling, the big term tends to be the India Asian collision with the Malayas Tibet and monsoons and, and all of those things of course dump into the Indian Ocean. So I'm just wondering if there's any prospect to get cores from the Indian Ocean instead of just Pacific and the Atlantic to test some of your beryllium uh, proxies there because I think that may be the first place to look for an actual signal. Yeah, so there's just a paper published on that. And unfortunately, beryllium can't go back farther than 10 million years. What you'd want is for it to go to this period in the Cenozoic. But it shows no change over the last 10 million years. And that's something that's, that's also thought to be the case for sediment volumes, that those are also constant now that people have uh, taken into account the biases with the cores, that they think that the erosion rates were also constant over that time interval. Well, I think we... Mm -mm. I'm going to be at the reception, so... Exactly. So I think <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, I will go to the reception. Thanks for the great questions.